fashion, we have a much different view. Tonight, so it's good to see you all. It's good to see a full room. We are at a very exciting part of our downtown plan for the start where um, all of the work that we have done up until this point starts to really come together in painting a picture and a point where we get to make some decisions on what those next steps start to look like and we start to kind of shape that future. So I think we will have a very robust discussion this evening. We are limited by a city council meeting at 7 o'clock, so we will look to the time block tonight to be done by about 6.45. I see a lot of very familiar faces in the room. Also wanted to point out, we do have Commissioner Miram, or Commissioner Washington County Commissioner Fred Miram with us this evening, and also an opportunity to say, you know, tight work and work at the dark house are made possible by some joint funding with Washington County. Yeah, make that possible. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Bruce and uh, keep on to make that All right, thanks, Mayor. Um, so I, I put a screen up with just kind of the general kinds of things that we want to accomplish with this evening's meeting. And essentially, we want to kind of in a cursory way, not in a really detailed way, you all have packets that have this information. But to, to look at what we've gotten in the way of community feedback about the information and the ideas that we've put forward so far, to confirm the directives uh, among the drafts, I think there are 11 of them that uh, you all are interested in pushing forward and developing into a draft overall plan uh, to discuss the topics that need more attention. I think we've heard about a couple of topics. One example would be the trailer parking uh, that I think some folks feel like ought to have more resolution in the plan. Um, and there might be others like that that we want to push forward. And then to think about priorities and decide if there are among the directives or of ideas that are not included in the directives that you want to see rise to the top and be identified in the draft plan as priorities. priorities. Um, so I, we're thinking in order to, to um, give as much time across all of the ideas as we can, we're going to take a quick cursory review of all of the directives first, kind of maybe without um, much presentation or much feedback. Um, and to hear from you overall kind of the kinds of impressions that you've got about what you see so far. Um, and then we'll dig in directive by directive in more detail. That's what we're kind of thinking from a coordination, um, meeting coordination standpoint. So hopefully that can work. Um, have you all had a, at least a cursory chance to take a look at the packet that went out last week and see any, see the comments that we received from the community, which um, I think are shockingly positive. I really am um, <laughs> pleased by how positive people were to all the comments or to all the directives. There were some, you know, things that folks didn't like also, but generally people were incredibly nice and incredibly uh, positive. So there's got to be more we can dig into that we see in the community comments so far. Um, so I'm going to open it to the floor just for general thoughts, um, comments that give us a basis to launch from uh, the feedback. Otherwise, what you agree? I think one of the things that we need to emphasize um, as we take this forward to the community <clears throat> is that this is going to need significant public money and significant private money. Um, and so um, this, the other thing is it will not happen tomorrow or next week or even next year that this is going to be a fairly long-term strategy and um, while yes some aggressiveness would be nice patience is also going to be needed and that's that's just something that really wasn't I keep in mind as we're digging down into each of the individual directives. Common themes you're hearing as you're, you're reviewing information or talking to community members. I think generally positive. Um, and I know that we have talked about it as a council a little bit, the importance of slowing the community down a little bit and bringing them along with us. So Susan, I'm glad you brought that up. 
on, um, but, but generally very positive. But I do think they have a vision of this occurring much more quickly than it probably can occur, um, given the infrastructure issues and a lot of that work that needs to be done before we can get to what looks great, you know, above ground. So, um, so I think communication in that regard is really important. Yeah. Well, whereas there should be some sort of a preliminary schedule or something that can help people understand the time frame. You know, something that says, look, it isn't going to happen next year. This is a 10 year plan. Here's kind of the steps that we may take to do it. And of course, it can change again. But, you know, some people would want to be able to, they, you can talk about it, but visually, I think it'd be important to show them something visually too. I don't know what that looks like, but it's difficult because it's moving parts to it, of course. But part of the plan that we Okay. Okay. Good. I Headliners that on the positive side, almost all the comments were yes, we want downtown to be more vibrant. Yes, we want stuff in downtown. Yes, we want redevelopment here. So it it wasn't a don't touch it. We like it the way it is. No, it's, and that's having that kind of positive engagement. That's a bonus. Not to be taken for granted. How many elephants in the room we should toss on the table before we have to get into the details? How much has taken on there? There are 61 roundabout seems to be one that I would say. Um, you know, I, but beyond the comments that are in the packet, I have had a pretty rigorous email stream on of constituents at this point, pointing out both the congestion, both the pedestrian concerns and then also just the congestion that we left on the about creates at certain times of the day. And I put that in as an elephant in the room because it's an intersection of two streets that we don't, they're critically important to downtown, but we aren't in direct control of either of those. Um, and certainly there's some concerns to what we're talking about being to a overall downtown. Mayor, it's been long enough since there was a stoplight there that folks have forgotten how god awful it was <laughs> trying to get through that intersection in any direction when there was a stoplight. And and our memories are short. We're we're doing the work tomorrow. I think we're also seeing some overall run concerns in our city. Run about it near the schools and then run about it next seven and it's just like about communication and enforcement. I think around the bus is pedestrian traffic in your own block. Otherwise, uh, the congestion thing is half of what it used to be, or less. Uh, and so we need to, you know, we get. And I believe it was originally designed as a two way roundabout <coughs> as well, which kind of changed traffic flow once it moved to one lane as well. But I, I remember. For that, at Fairview, Wyoming, and it took me, I live in Forest Lake, and it took me 20 to 30 minutes to get to work because of that stoplight back in the day. So, so it's much better than it used to be. Remember, have there been any discussions with uh, Minnesota State relative to 61 at all at this point in terms of how you're reviewing what could happen? Um, I'll defer to Brian. We, we've let them know that. This is being kind of discussed as a possibility. Have there been direct discussions? We'll wait till the next years. Has there been any look into whether the uh, boat club could shift down as the boat launch goes away someplace else? Has there been discussions relative to that idea? So far, there has not been a legitimate um, idea put forward as an alternative to the boat launch downtown. What are you talking about? Yeah. Well, it's big puzzle pieces that if they can move, you know, at one point in time there was a possibility of the lake house being converted, which might have meant they could have had boat access out there, which might have meant we could take it off the city lot, which might have meant the boat club could move down a little bit and expand the horizon of the, uh, the park. All of that I think would have been wonderful, but I don't know how to solve the relocation of uh, the boat launch.
survey what's on your mind? Anything else that we haven't mentioned so far? Just as headliners, Jerry? I saw a few people ask me because it's been in the media about the potential redevelopments of the Benelli's property there and how that impacts the downtown redevelopment. They don't really understand everything, all they hear and they've seen, you know, some of the layouts, some of that. So, something that I think we need to be cognizant of is that um, you know, there was discussion among constituents that say, oh, they're going to redevelop that. So, how does that play into what we see, see here? Correct. And how does that relate and also just bring some education? Yes, that is a big block, but that's correct. The entire downtown is connected to downtown. So at some point, I think it needs to be somehow in this plan, uh, at least mentioned or addressed somehow. And it does lead you back to this view that we're trying to expect out of the roundabout's a hairy place. Everything out there is a hairy place, and so that view now caverns between a new development which would tend to grab the most positive route toward the uh, toward 61 excuse me toward broadway that's the vital corner of it so we're tending to find more of an obstruction so how do we value this view to the lake mayor just one more that i've heard that only didn't come up in the written comments as much as i've heard um, from folks verbally that they're very skeptical about whether at grade crossings anywhere not just at the roundabout but at grade crossings anywhere on 61 can be made safe for that long anything else all right i think we're ready to go into Sounds good. So you've got uh, these pages within your packets, and what we try to do is, is highlight the, the things that rise to the top of people's comments. So that's the, the yellow or the lighter colored text that you see. I've highlighted a few things um, here that seem to really be themes, and they were iterated in what we just talked about. But the roundabout, um, connection to the lake or lakes, um, roundabout again, parking issues, walkability um, are big, big themes. Um, and, you know, again, again, the light. But all of these things have kind of threads of, of thematic information or thematic comments that people have made. Um, but those were a few that, that rose to the top. So the Lake Street corridor, and this is kind of a whole host of of an idea, one common idea around modifying the Lake Street Corridor, and then a host of strategies uh, that get us there to narrow the lanes um, in exchange for widening the streetscape, to implement pedestrian-oriented streetscape improvements, including trees, um, to redesign the crossings um, at the traffic circle, but otherwise as well, and to maintain or expand on-street parking. So those are the, the strategies that are built into that. These are the comments that we received, and I'll just really quickly highlight those. Um, definitely going in the right direction, across the walkway at the traffic circle, and it, it is uh, not safe. Um, I find the current setting uncomfortable and unfriendly. I uh, would also suggest slower traffic speeds to help, help with safety. The pedestrian crossings at the roundabout are dangerous. There are studies that imply that trees close to the road slow down residential traffic. Um, but not sure that there are studies that suggest the same commercial traffic, and they do. Uh, there are there is a lot of analysis around what street trees do, and we know that trees slow down traffic and make people feel more comfortable in a pedestrian space. Um, so those are um, analyzed facts. So um, I'm going to go back to this. Directive, and we'll actually cover the. You see the image of the idea of a grade separated uh, crossing or a skyway to connect future parking um, with the, the lake side of downtown. We'll talk about that in a future one, but I'll leave it on this slide just to use it as a backdrop for your discussion about uh, this category of strategies and this directive. So, again, I'll open it up to the So the idea of eliminating that, that center turn lane, it seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, I think it's used a lot, even with a little bit extra snow, 
you find yourself, it seems narrow anyway, and so you're, you're finding yourself using that lane to drive the most. So has there been any discussion with the state or potentially maybe the county to turn back about eliminating that? They designed it that way for a reason that they have to ask you to see that be an issue? We certainly would want to engage other agencies that have a little authority. The, it's been that obviously a bit down way right now. There are discussions about turn back to the county um, at some point in the future. We don't know how far those discussions have gone. Don't know what the timing of that would be. Um, but what we what we do know is that when the roadway was designed the way it was, there were more ways of getting into parking lots or um, what's going on on the edges of the roadway than there are today. And as more redevelopment happens downtown, um, likely the ones that still exist will be reduced in number, which makes a turn lane less needed or important to the overall traffic. So all of those things combined um, in this preliminary stage would suggest that it could at least be on the table as a possibility. Well, yeah, it seems like such a big part of this right now. That conversation should start immediately with, with, with the state on something like this. Because if they're going to say no, then then you got to go to a different plan, I guess. Brian might disagree, but my experience has been that if they say no now, they might not say no. And if they say no in a year, they may not say no six months later. So um, these kinds of conversations are fluid. Typically, won't say no um, in an early stage like this. They'll identify things that need to be addressed, need to be studied, and it's possible. Any other points of conversation? This is the first on the list. I'm doing this is like the top three have gotten the most discussion at other meetings, and so maybe it is time to the next one is uh, parking. Um, probably the highest cost strategy or directive within the plan. Um, it suggests that there is a parking shortage to some extent within the overall downtown district. That um, a way to address that parking shortage would be be to create a district parking facility, probably attached to redevelopment in the northwest quadrant of downtown, seems to be the most likely possibility. Um, and to connect that parking with the place most people want to go, which is the lake side of Highway 61, with an overpass uh, that would connect that parking facility over to the other side of 61. Um, so the strategies are um, to construct, con construct that structured district parking facility in that Northwest Quadrant, to connect it via the Skyway, to do more detailed parking analysis to really hone in how much um, additional parking actually is needed within the downtown district, and to adjust the zoning co code uh, from its current parking requirement to something slightly at least less. Yeah, Is it too early to ask how a parking ramp would be funded? Um, no, um, I can discuss how other communities fund them. Sometimes they are a straight up municipal bonding project and they are a standalone municipal structure and um, that's how they're funded and they are either financed from an operating standpoint through a special service district or through general just general taxes um, and other forms. Sometimes though, and probably more often today, they are attached to a redevelopment project and are made part of a tax increment finance strategy of redevelopment. So they're a public private partnership. If we don't learn from our history, we are doomed to repeat it. And um, 
I, I think the scenario three on here um, that implies that there is any kind of transit in the medium or long-term future of this area is not is not realistic at all. Um, and I think that um, this is not going to be a downtown that is going to be predominantly uh, um, the residential folks within a half mile or a mile will be populating and, and, and doing the retail and restaurants in this downtown. Uh, if we're looking at, at the kinds of retail and the kinds of restaurants, it's going to be people driving there and meeting people there. Um, and so the, the, the parking requirements, I think, are going to be much closer to scenario one um, and, and maybe a split between scenario one and scenario two. But then as you get into your directives, um, one of them is adjust the zoning code to reduce parking requirements for commercial and residential users. And, and from both a planning perspective, our history, and what I am seeing in another couple of cities that are reducing those parking requirements, that would not be good for this community in the long haul. And all we have to do is take a look at um, the, the decisions that we made with respect to the, the gone property that has a restaurant in it. Um, two, two parking spaces for that facility and then the overflow on even a regular not a day when they have a large event um, at lunch like Lakes Gas or, or one of the other companies has a, a meeting there. The, the parking really does overflow. And so, um, so you're suggesting, Susan, that we take off the strategy of modifying the zoning code? Yes, I am. Okay. And take off scenario three. Okay. Um, I would. I would like to reinforce that as well. That's a big consideration. History does prove. I just want to make sure I understand. So you say, you saying also take off the parking study? Not the parking study. Take off the adjust the zoning code to reduce the parking requirements for commercial and residential users. Yes. It, it's just it's counterproductive to what we want, what we're looking for. We're looking to bring more people in. We're looking to 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 have people want to come to this community. And and there is a transit here. There the, the kinds of things that I think we're looking at, except for for a couple of the restaurants, are not going to be the, the bike thing. Um, I I just yeah. And I know you're waiting for development to answer a lot of these questions, um, but the parking ramp on that north end is still, no matter how you bring people across the street or over the street, is still very distant from everything that will happen in that other quadrant down there. And unless there's a requirement for that developer to you know, take care of their own needs, which should remain pretty high for restaurants, a restaurant, you know, takes a certain amount of parking, and housing takes the one and a half cars or better, that there is a good sizable amount that's left for the north bed, uh, south end because that's too much distance to expect people to really be serviced and come to those destinations. <coughs> and so that distribution of parking has always been important to me. So when you say south end, more of a, you use the word distribution, more of a district, a distributed strategy rather than consolidating it into a single structure and expecting that to serve Downtown. Yes, I know you're adding bits and pieces, but I think there has to be a heavy hit down at that southern end where it's really known as public parking. Uh, it is city owned property for the most part where the open land parking is. And so I think there can be an expectation of the developer to uh, commit to a certain number of cars that would satisfy a certain distance. And you need specifically that southeast south one. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Bruce, what do you, as far as what you would call successful downtown, what 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 are you seeing? I mean, I'd hate for something between four and five to be a deal breaker to bring a major developer to come in because we're requiring too much parking. What what are you seeing? That's I this is a, five see, is on the high end, right? I mean, yeah, I don't see really any downtowns anymore that are requiring the five. Um, 
Most of them are between three and a half and four. Um, and then the ones that are transit rich are even lower. But that's not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. That's not for us, but that's more informational. That's what I'm saying. So the ones that are pulling back from that high requirement, are they subsidizing that as a, as a community and saying, we're not going to require that as a developer, but we're providing those spaces as a community, or it's those spaces that are just not being provided? No, I, I guess what I'm, I'm looking at parking needs. Um, we have two restaurants that are destination restaurants. We have Stella's that has a certain number of square foot of restaurant space. And we, we can see what that parking lot looks like on a Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday night, Saturday night. And we have the log cabin and we know what their square footage is and we know how that not only is on their property but in the surrounding area um and so i think that to that that might be something to look at and model our parking expectations based on the really specific situation that you face yes yeah absolutely all right instead of saying well you know other three and whatever Folks, folks are going to drive to the retail. They're going to drive to the the the, the restaurants. Even if we are to line both sides of Lake Street in that area with commercial residential above, you're not looking at more than fifteen hundred people, and so those restaurants and those stores are going to be depending on folks from the outside. Yeah, I just tell, I'm curious if we talk about back to the parking on the south side, which I can agree with. Is the community ready to have height? Because to get more parking there, we're going to have to go higher. And what's the height? Is it five stories? Is it six stories? Is it seven stories? Is, is the community ready for that? Is it precluded now in the zoning ordinance? I think it's four. Like four or or five. we have five or down at yeah, uh, Lighthouse? Sure. Four or, or five. Because the altitude means a lot. <laughs> right. And so if you're talking about putting you know, 100 spaces in the development for public parking, that's basically a story, a story and a half of parking that you have to do higher. So not to watch it, but you have to be aware that if you're going to put southern parking in a redevelopment of the southern part there, the height may be an issue. Especially if proximity is a requirement, right? That if we're concerned about walking too far, then the solution for that is height. What do you want to hear about height? I'm hopeful we can uh, allow for something. There should be real punctuation downtown in the right spots for visibility of the lakes. Uh, and there can be some subgrade work relative to getting parking without going the whole full story up. There are solutions to it, and I just want to be sure that we we're defending that when we deal with developers for that area. I have no trouble with the tower. I can see great design solutions in unique punctuation downtown. Uh, so I have no trouble with altitude. It might have to clear it about eight, but you know, where our fire trucks can handle. We haven't addressed height really at all in the directives from a zoning standpoint. Should we? Should we? You know, the way we are making a suggested should, suggestion so far about parking standards, should we be delving into the height issue? I think height depends on location. Yep. Um, yes. For instance, if, if if we're saying to developer Q, yeah, you can go right up to the, the sidewalk with eight stories, to me, that's a problem. That That's a much different visibility. And, and we, we keep talking about being able to see the lake, see the lake. Well, and I'll use Park Place as the example. I mean, it, it's, it was slammed right up against the, the very minimum sidewalk. If it's something that's stepped back, that's 
that may be a different question. So I think it depends on, on whether or not we're creating um, high tunnels or whether we're, you know, what we're, what we're looking at. I would certainly like to see it be site specific. Yeah, some solutions can be derived there and some can't. And I can certainly see approaching that However, this is going to be zoned and judged in zoning. Approach of that by compelling certain setbacks as you go along, and compelling certain grade level activities and attributes that you might want. Uh, but that doesn't, shouldn't preclude that. Uh, I'm saying eight's probably about as far as you're going to take it because that will that will be challenging to every other. It'll be such a punctuation that damn will be done well. <laughs> Well, does the group, would the group like me to um, put a draft forward around this topic and distribute it to the people? Okay. So it doesn't mean that we're going to, just the way we're not um, making a detailed suggestion about Hartley, we're not going to make a detailed suggestion about the zoning standards, but it might be design standards, it might be Exploring approaches to height Do you take it so far as to actually talk about that distribution of parking then? Oh, like yeah. Compelling? Okay. Yeah. So I'm hearing that that needs to be a modification. I think it's something, um, it's something we should be considering in the plan because if we are not currently considering it, I suspect that not the developers will be asking the question. And I'd rather us be able to give a proactive response as to how we feel about height um, based on this process rather than us not tackle it and the developers only go up for that question consistent to that. That's not anyone disagree. I do think it's an important part also for community communication. We're going to have points of this plan that conflict with each other. Um, and land uses that are uh, questions about it, and certainly maybe, um, having it as part of the plan, if nothing else, on-site conversation, how's that feedback, and what is the future? Does improving walkability and surrounding neighborhoods impact parking positively? I mean, I just. I think of a couple people I know with small children that for strollers that will not, they'll drive to Arts in the Park. Yeah. And they're just a few blocks away just simply because it's not safe, you know. Um, um, so I would suggest thinking about that topic as a really long term yeah. um, modification of the people for the to, to build a walkable neighborhood surrounding downtown is probably not going to have any impact whatsoever in parking requirements and the amount people drive. But 25 years from now, um, it's going to have a big impact on the way people in the surrounding neighborhoods feel about downtown, how they feel about owning downtown, and how much they walk with home. I just think it's, you know, of value you know, to have it on the radar as we're taking a look at street improvements, you know, and potentially, you know, so we're not, we're a little more proactive thought-wise than stepping back and saying, you know, we just redid the street, we should have, we should have thought about some sidewalks, right? So. And I think over time, you know, you can think about it as shaving off the peak requirements of both traffic that shave is five percent, five percent of the overall total, which doesn't feel like a lot, but it has an impact, and it's an impact on how that sounds. Um, Any other comments on parking before we should move on to Sunday more So the strategies here to narrow the street to the extent feasible, you know, this is a tough one. This is a tough one because the street is already fairly narrow. 
Um, uh, suggestion is that we should maintain two way traffic. We got some comments about maybe one way, and that would be fine. Um, we believe from a traffic circulation standpoint that's going to be challenging if we try to make it a one way. Um, to implement streetscape enhancements, lighting and sidewalk on the business side. Some on street parallel parking, we've got some negative comments around parallel parking on this one, and parallel parking because it would consume green space and some trail. Um, and then uh, wayfinding signage comments there were technically really positive. Question because I don't know the answer. Uh, the trail is that controlled by Washington County, and then the green space around it is that city or county? It's a combination, most of it is county. So, can we do any planning with Require partnership. Okay, <laughs> right. And what you're seeing, let's like, just assume we can get state or someone to go along with us on the highway 61 streetscape and that removes the turn lane need because we're not going to necessarily penetrate it. and we're going to wait till we get to the two ends in some fashion to be able to penetrate which is hard on the broadway side at least you know? um, and maybe it'll be easier on the uh, northern side do you perceive that being the primary feeder for all the businesses that go into that slot where we have the parking ramp. Is that going to be the feeder both north and south of Broadway as you see it? Do you, do you mean Centennial? Is yes. Centennial the feeder? It's the feeder north of, well, yes, it would be. If we are looking at a distributed parking strategy, and if that public parking is on the west side of Lake Street or 61, I do, I do see Centennial. It is really narrow south, going south right off Broadway. Um, if, if somebody is trying to make a right turn yes. off of Centennial, often people trying to make a right turn on the Centennial have to work. Yes. And so I'm not sure you can narrow it anymore. Yeah, it's narrow. It is narrow. Yeah. Yeah. My worry about Centennial. I don't really have a worry about any one of these items. My worry is there's a lot of items on a very small street. So my worry is that we're asking a lot. Do we have um, so one of the maybe one so one of the points I see on Centennial is um, wanting to facilitate trail accessibility which is great, but do we have feedback that you maybe feel like there aren't enough parking spaces to access the trail? Is that a, is that a need that we've heard? There, there is, the old city hall and Hugo are the two places really, well, and, and, and the um, training center the library. Are, are really where one can access, get off the trail and go someplace else. Yeah, I think we've heard that people, they don't bother trying to use downtown Forest Lake as a gateway to the trail because it's too difficult. <laughs> they go somewhere else, which isn't good for you. But I don't no, agree. I think that's what we've heard. These folks are planning their ride and they're going to stop for lunch or a bite or a snack. They're going to do it at Subway in Hugo or they're going to do it up in Wyoming at, the, at their Areas. Well, if, it, if you succeed with this loop, and that does what you're projecting it does in schematic form, um, that should, in some ways, draw us to the business. Uh, the whole goal of this thing is to draw them to the lakefront. And so um, it should be, if successful over long term, a bit of a remedy. You've got to facilitate the the stopping, a place to stop, and getting across. Yes, not a trailhead though necessarily. 
I, mean, I don't, has, has there really been any discussion about how else, other than skyways and such, how are we crossing the street? Are there yellow safety lights? Are there something? Yeah. Um, so pedestrian activated crossings, the strategy, although it's not really explicitly yeah. stated in the directive, it sounds like it should be. Uh, but pedestrian activated crossing signals at first southwest or southeast and second is part of that I think that should be spelled out right now. Yeah. 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 And that's where I've gotten pushback or feedback from folks really skeptical about whether we can truly create a safe crossing system. That a lot. People are pretty strong. I think it is possible. I've seen it used at work in other situations, but I understand the skills. You know what you see, you know what you've right, experienced. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's mainly as we're trying to be um, articulate this one. When this, this directive comes up as the next, next layer of planning, I think it'd be helpful maybe you a centennial schematic that shows where we're adding what because uh, I think through discussion uh, you know for example um, streetscape enhancements including lighting and a sidewalk on the business side I think that it has been implied to be the segment of the street that's showing in the picture not necessarily what would happen south of Broadway um, south of Broadway I think perhaps has some different use and so kind of breaking these strategies up into the layer of centennial, which I think helps to create a picture that's more clear and maybe would help to guide next discussion on, again, are we asking too much of centennial? Uh, one more thought on centennial, since I use that all the time. There are, on uh, north of Broadway, south of Broadway, there are bikers and hikers that get off the trail and just walk across the street to a Kodiak property. Uh -huh. They go to Don Pablo's, they use it. Um, so just let it throw that in there. It's not just totally unused. We are used to this species. And it, it's really heartening in the spring when the blossoms are out on all the spread those trees, the amount of foot traffic and sight traffic and rollerbladers. And, and, it's a love trail. Okay, I think I've got a picture of this one. Uh, the retail loop high So that stretch of space between Broadway and Second Northwest, and the notion of concentrating retail, not precluding retail elsewhere in downtown, just attempting to concentrate retail uh, at the front edge of Lake Street on both sides between those two streets. So make, a, uh, make minor adjustments to the uh, zoning code to compel retailing at the street in this area, and then offer financial incentives to the extent that's possible to establish continuous retail frontage within that area. And an attempt to create a storefront, storefront cadence of entries into the retail front. When you uh, segue into your next phase and talk about the, the municipal cost statement and these things, uh, will you find yourself talking, say, just about that area? We're not, we're not seeing the southern area yet. Just about that area in your cost appraisal, or will you be thinking about it considering coming down between the other two quadrants as well? So, will the pricing be talking about incremental distances? So this particular one, we'll be talking about cost or pricing from an incentive standpoint. And the way it's currently written, it would be incentives for this stretch between Broadway up the second northwest. With, um, I guess, the underlying assumption, whether it's said or not, that retail is going to happen anywhere in downtown. It's just that we want to encourage continuous retail from the chain. And therefore, we're going to put some incentive dollars on it. Incentive dollars is one thing, and then the cost of construction, you're doing both, right? Well, in this case, this is really only dealing with incentives because the tools that the city has available 
to implement is probably only on the incentive side. Because they don't, the city doesn't necessarily own the land. So when you're done talking about that territory, that corridor, there won't be an ass uh, assessment at all about what does that really mean in dollars? It will just be the incentivization that we have to go forward. Well, it will mean in the dollars of, of the incentive, yes. Yeah, I think I follow you, but I'm not sure. <laughs> just the incentive doesn't cover the cost. The incentive helps. Okay. Right. This would be asking private property owners to, um, to do what they need to do. Uh, in their leasing arrangements, in their operations, to uh, create retail, downtown retail store coverage within this area. And the city is willing and able to provide some incentive for you to do this in cover. Ben, are you suggesting that the city help people build new buildings here? No, much more okay. than that. The, the financial cost of building. There is a cost right. that comes along with all the streetscape that would exist yeah. right there and changing the street, enhancing the sidewalks, whatever that's going to be. There's a cost associated with that. We were just talking about incentivizing businesses and maybe the city as well to make that more probable without knowing what that cost really is. The, ca the capital cost of streetscape is included in the other thing. Oh, it is? Oh, okay. yeah, absolutely. Good. There will be a full kind of cost uh, capital cost um, budget put together for street investments. Okay, and that would go for a definition of parking ramp uh, as well. And then you have to find that parking ramp to be so much. And, okay, just as long as we're following that, I think yeah. I'll, I'll be uh, showing a lot of my concerns when I see that cost analysis come through as to what could be prioritized and what could be worked out. Okay, Great. but to maintain it, you're going to need something like a downtown improvement district. Yeah, there will be suggestions yeah, for I mean, how that... the city could address the operational expenses associated with this plan. Otherwise, we put a lot of investment of capital and, and political investment. Um, and if it's if there's not a, a mechanism built into this, it will go away quickly. As I, um, as I see this, um, I think one of the risks to this area is um, just the shift in the strategic landscape of retail. My concern um, is what is the amount of density that can be supported in even that retail district. Um, and my concern is that maybe we're trying to incentivize the other part of the bear. And so I'm not sure how it was reflected, but I just, I just think about Concerns for this one that's that's a concern. And when you're kind of incentivizing something, you're kind of by uh, choice disincentivizing other things. And um, is that trade off worth it? Is this question. Yes. I do like the idea of condensing retail, but again, you have so much to do in this beautiful detail in the southern requirements, so maybe they would have the ability to do so, and I would say it's not really our role to tell them no, um, and then that just kind of pulls away from this concept of the That conflict concerns me of just overall success of this part of the GDP. Although, was it U.S. Chamber of Commerce that came out just this week with the data showing that people are going to brick and mortar instead of um, online, that they're returning to brick and mortar and that for that there has been a shift in the last what three to six months, Blake, you may have seen this one. Um, that that now we're seeing people returning to brick and mortar. I think that's the problem to have Yeah, yeah, we just have to correct the bed. So I think this one there, there are very limited tools that the city has at its disposal to try and make this happen. Um, so you're right. I'm not saying that. It's not all Any other concerns or anyone would like to see this or kind of articulated in a different way or anything more missing in this one? Yeah. 
are always important to these. This one implies in a couple of stretches that there would be some parking removal um, within that current parking area um, adjacent to the district post walkway. For parking reconfigurations, we're probably some I'm not sure if it's in some other place for the back, but is there anything being done to the surface parking, existing surface parking area right now? I mean, is there any streetscape going in there? Is there any enhancements to that flat, big black top area out there? Uh, right now, there's not a directive for that, but there certainly could be. I mean, we're doing all this nice, you know, streetscape, you know, planting trees, stuff like that, and then we have this huge asphalt parking lot out there that's very naked. So maybe we put in you know, some curbs and some center areas and some treescape in there, whatever, just to enhance the area. It's unfortunately, may take out the parking spots, but in the whole theme of what we're doing downtown, it would seem to me that you, you want to do something in that service parking area. Back on district charging and approve the aesthetics of existing downtown. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And are you talking specifically that? Cherry Creek or that Memorial Park. Yeah, the Memorial Park parking lot there. Okay. If one were to arrive at the larger public park, some kind of public parking, we could right. think about reducing that proposition Correct. to Correct. people who need we want to get in and out of businesses. Uh, right. But at the point until we find our priorities, we know it rings. Yep. Uh, that's all fairly important. Part. Right. Yeah. But that might be one of the phase things is that it comes once the public parking you know vertically happens then you can start doing some answers yeah. to that i agree service parking great okay going back to the um downtown greenway group i think next iteration of the minor when you talk when we say amenity rich i think it'd be helpful to illustrate how a little more specifically what do we mean by amenity rich um So, some illustration of what that might include would be helpful. Um, you know, I think just an idea that comes to mind would be for a town full of history and maybe amenity rich is not just a pedestrian group, but also the work of you know, Forest Lake Historical Society and Old Forest Lake, and just including placards that could tell the story of Forest Lake along the way, or something that kind of helps to. Not just a trail, but there's some things to see along the way that are kind of you know, landmarks and history. So something like that that makes it's a little bit more descriptive. Um, what, what that experience would look like. I see the schematic, and I'm always left wondering what does that mean? What does it feel like that there's interruptions one, two, three, four, five before you get to the existing part? in this idea of a continuous movement system. What is that movement system? Is it a sidewalk that it caught like six, seven feet that accommodates bikers and walkers? And is it landscaping on both sides to get some sort of nice cover? What is that environment? I can't quite picture it. Great, yeah, I think I hear both of you saying the same thing. Gotcha. So we're On this, this section going south from the park and moving to this parking area that's on the other side of 61, are you, are you suggesting omitting any uh, road or, or traffic, car traffic through there where this is showing? And then we, you have to obviously include some ADA compliant sidewalks or trails or that <coughs> through that space there? Yeah. 
it would mean um, adjusting how parking and garbage, I think, too, is handled in that southwest quadrant. Um, adjacent to what's currently being proposed for the development there. Southwest or southeast? Sorry, southeast. Okay, yeah. thank you. And I think they could stay, Blake, I think they could stay off of the, the road that feeds the townhomes, for example, but that, that will impose itself on whatever development happens there. And it almost feels to me like you're going to decide what that concourse feels like and what the amenities are, then define what push did that put against the future development. So there's some sense that there's a setback on this uh, requirement there. Otherwise, you I don't know what you're walking on. It's very pleasant to walk on. So the strategies here are to increase the number and enhance the quality of transient boat slips uh, that exist there to establish shore launch and tie up beach area for kayak so not motorized introduce winter programming and some options or ideas around that to improve the sight lines and character at the snowmobile lake access on second southwest enhance shoreline aesthetics and improve resistance to ice action um, to improve that kind of character of the shoreline that you see in the image. Um, it's a little more aesthetic and probably functions a little more than the next one. So he is around this one. Jerry? Um, I'm not sure we've properly addressed the lake meet here in Canada yet. Um, you know, until there's a decision as to what happens with your boat club, there is no room for a canoe kayak launch area. You don't think so? No, no way. Particularly if you're going to expand the transient boat slips, because of the boat slips you're going to have to go north from the existing public dock versus south because of the beach area there. So now there's very little room right now between the public dock and your boat club. It would be it would be highly dangerous to try to put in kayaks and uh, canoe launching between the public dock and your boat club. And there is no room on the north side of your boat club because you're right up against the public launch. So the concept of what's happening here can really depends on what, what happens to your boat club. Does it have to be your boat club or do you mean do you mean? any sort of well i mean your if your club or anybody else yeah if your boat club is not okay. there you will now open up a tremendous amount of space along shore that you can do a number of things you can enhance the transient boat spaces and your kayak and canoe launch here and stuff like that but candidly there is no room i think we're kidding ourselves if we think it's a safe environment to add more people into that area where your boat club is and the public dockings so how about the southern space for kayak the beach space kind of on the southern you could part. perhaps put it down at that south end up against the beach area there i was just going to say that as well just yeah. what about adjacent to the beach yeah yeah you'd have to move it down there they want the sandy beach anyhow they wouldn't want to go into yeah. the they, they do they want yeah, yeah, yeah. sandy yeah. beach yeah. <laughs> And the, one of the things we've always <laughs> one thing we've always heard is is to bring more people from the lake to downtown, and so the the, the, the amount of transient boat slips is extremely important. It isn't adding you know ten or twelve of them. We're, we're talking you know, 15, 20, 25 additional slips there, because there are many times when that public dock down there is filled with full of boats. And there's no place for people to come. They just turn around and go back home again because there's no place for them to tie up. So if you want to keep on the lake to come to downtown, you gotta give them a place to, to dock the boat. Do you think we've adequately addressed that with number one? I'm just broadly stating the goal of adding increasing the number and the Well again, you can't add that number if the docking space for your boat club stays there. You cannot add 15, 20, 25 
boat slips to the public dock area. There's not enough room between the docks to bring in another whole set of boats to put boats in there. But you've been there. It, yeah, it is, so on this, I'm not seeing in this, this map, I'm not seeing anything showing the boat club or whoever, a marina, right? Uh, is that, are we saying that that's? No, it's, it, the suggestion is it stays as it is essentially. Just doesn't hide it. But, yeah. but it's something from a big plan standpoint has to be considered. It's there. The, this concept of adding more transient boats is not very possible. I think it's, it's further easy. north in your picture. It's it's not it is. Rope Club isn't in the picture. Right. Right. It's further it, north. It's yeah. it's further north. Yeah, but what I'm hearing from Jerry is that in order to really have a meaningful number of transient slips, which let's say is twenty five, um, you don't believe, and I, I think we know more about this than any of us, you don't believe there's enough space between our boat club and the beach to add that number of transient slopes. Between your boat club and the beach? Mm -hmm. Or the public dock? The public dock. Yeah. Between your boat club and the beach? The public dock. Coming south. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, well, the public dock is also there. Yeah, the public dock is there right now. But that's north of our boat club. No, it's south, 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 south. Yeah. Very south, right. So where the only place you add to boats slip is that's exactly where the public dock is coming up the big circle. The little right. circle yes. above that is where your boat club comes off that walkway up to the east. Correct. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can add some to, to the south of the public dock. When you start pushing into it, you're going to have your canoe and kayak area there. That is not a safe environment. So it kind of starts to compound itself. Yeah. And it's a big part of what we're up to, you know. I mean, there's a lot of people on this lake that want to come downtown. And I've had people say, I don't take my boat downtown anymore because I got no place to park anymore. Parks in the park, it's completely full there. An example. Let me find some design work around how the docks currently lay out and do more detailed design. This one, like others that were getting more conceptual design. And then the, you, you brought up someone brought up earlier the whole the whole trailer parking situation with the launch there. As Mark mentioned, I mean, it's very difficult to consider you know moving that launch. I'm not sure you could ever move it any place. And um, the amount of traffic coming to that launch in downtown is, is not going to diminish. It's only going to increase. So you know, that problem is not is not going away and I don't know how we're going to address it. It's been talked about for years. How to deal with it. And I would hope that in this plan we would have a plan because if we don't have a plan now, we're not going to have a plan in five years from now, ten years from now. Either. Does that imply, Jerry, that a plan means purchasing a site and developing something elsewhere? Could be. I mean, this launch is city owned, it's not DNR controlled. So, the flexibility is tremendous. There's very few private or public launches on any lakes in Minnesota that are of this size that are not DNR controlled. So the DNR doesn't limit the number of slips we have in the lake? DNR does have some control. They kind of yeah. share when it was installed back in 2000 ish, whenever it was installed. We got grant funds from them, so they do have control over the access to a point based on that agreement that we had with the DNR when it was installed back in Was your question to ask how many boat slips <laughs> for the access to the lake? Um, I thought it was number of boat slips because we talked about this EDA. Yes, there is a there is a requirement in the agreement about number of parking stalls that had to be dedicated to boat trailer parking back when that was installed. But not boat slips. No. Not, boat not, not slips on the water. No, but parking stalls for boat trailer parking that was dedicated to boat trailer. Have to go back to the agreement. There is an end date on there, but I don't. I'd have to go back to the agreement. 
other factor that comes back in there. They won't be able to see that position, but there's a regulation in the place that says you got to get the same thing. But and to the point of moving it, there was an extensive conversation back in 2000 before it was installed there of looking at other options for that particular access. That was the most cost effective location for it. That's for why it was there. And when that was actually proposed to be closed back in 2000, when I say 2000, that time period, a lot of members of the public came in support of wanting to keep the access there. So there's a lot of people who are very supportive of maintaining that access there as well. So it has been studied pretty extensively you know, multiple times. It's been there forever. We all know that. Right. Uh, so a lot of history is there. It's just that the number of people using it over the last 20 years has tripled. So there's a that's, that's a bit of a puzzle piece. Yeah, this one really is a puzzle. I know. I know. <laughs> so, I know. On the positive side, I think we showed the weekend of the 19th that there is a, a lot of synergy that can happen in the winter on that lake. Between the kids' snowmobile and the rotary plunge, there was a lot of activity and a lot of folks and a lot of enthusiasm. And I know that the, the, the Rotary and the snowmobile folks are already selected a date for next year uh, and want to do a better job of collaborating. We wanted to have the city as part of that. We, we started talking about it to them last summer about doing a, a winter festival thing, and that wasn't able to happen. But I think that, there, that we showed that there, there is a desire for winter recreation out there. And, Get a lot of folks down there on a freaking cold day. So on the on the topic of the launch, um, we I just want to put a couple of kind of alternative pathways in front of you and get your feedback. One way would be to say for this plan to um, assume the way it probably is right now, assume that what we have now is what we're going to have. The other uh, way the plan could address it is to suggest, it's not going to do the study, you can't do the study, but suggest doing a detailed analysis of possible relocation out of the downtown area of that the flavors there that they are going to I like the second one. Does the city own the land? DNR, DNR controlled. Yeah. The only launch that's not controlled by DNR is the one in Fargo. Others want to weigh in on that topic? You know, I, I think part of the objection to the to launch at Memorial is the whole trailer parking thing. You know, to do that. You know, it isn't that there's a launch there, it's what you do with all the cars and the trailers. I don't know if there's a solution. I don't know if there's ever been a vertical ramp for cars and trailers. Not practical probably because of the size of the turning rates and everything, but um, that's the objection is, is the amount of cars and trailers. It's not whether the boats come in and out of the lake right there, it's where what happens with the vehicles. And watching it, a lot of times there'll be somebody that, that comes with the boat and trailer and then there's two cars that come with it with those families to get onto that boat that came with the right. truck and trailer. Right. And whether there is remote parking, designated trailer parking on the, the east or west side of 61 someplace, I think some people would walk if they found a place to park if they had to walk two blocks from their car with the trailer. Um, and drop everything off there at the, at the launch and go park the car and trailer and walk back. Is there a fee to park the trailer there or to launch? Is there a fee to launch or park the trailer? So maybe if you had a fee to park, but you didn't have a fee to park across the road and walk the blast? I think if there were if there were a remote parking strategy that were implemented, it's 
it's going to require more enforcement than has happened. And so a couple, a couple things on the, on the trailer parking thing. If you go down on St. Croix River, they'll charge you $40 to, to park your boat, and then they'll run you to a golf cart somewhere off-site to do some parking. That happens at Bayport and some other places there. So that might be a way to, to accommodate that. Obviously, there's some cost. Maybe that becomes a park ranger as well that, that runs that. It's just as extra manager the, in the city. Uh, and as far as uh, this layout and what happens to the boat club and if that you know expands, similar to the conversations with the MnDOT, I think conversation with DNR have to start immediately is to find out exactly what we can do. Pushing out is going to help you know save that that real estate, that footprint going out. But I know that there's probably some limitations and, and square footage requirements or limitations as well that DNR will allow you, will allow you to exceed. So I think there's opportunities to, to fix that. We just are governed by that. And I think talking to them sooner or later is, is key. Uh, okay. Well, there's one way before we move on to the next topic. One of the tricks we always did with boating and crowded docks was if you do have a distance place for your trailer, right? To provide just the dock so you can throw the boat in, you go drive far away that spot is to park, but then the boating people can come pick you up at that dock. I think we have a lot of these dead-end streets you guys are aware about around the lake, yeah. which then might be adjacent to, you know, a little, little shorter walking distance to some less valuable property. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, if you don't provide all that kind of talked about, then people would walk down somebody else's yard off their own dock. We do the same thing. But that's one way to circumvent you know, get around what the issue we have is obviously it's the trailer and the length of some of these fishing boat trailers are just yeah. uh, so this is looking at a site adjacent to the Hardwood Creek Trail in alignment of First Street Southeast. Um, and the strategy is to create a trail wayside on uh, the first street, actually first street alignment uh, between Lake and Centennial. Um, that would include you know, components of public park and service to the bikers coming in, in combination with redevelopment, a uh, redevelopment strategy of that site as well. Some amount of redevelopment and parking put out that. Probably implies a uh, partnership arrangement with the developer, between the city and the developer, um, where the city would take on the public piece, the developer would take on a fairly limited uh, program. Back to the costing idea again, just beyond incentives, there's the cost to acquire land, and this, it's a whole city capsule of doing something. And then somehow subjugated themselves to a developer having a building. Um, I'm just always curious as to why instead of 7,400 square feet, two stories, we didn't continue the street in front. We didn't actually challenge the amount of park, mini park, before we get the street downtown to the bigger park. Uh, I just honestly can't find as many ways to create this welcoming entry and the concourse to get to where you want to go across the street. And it just seems like way up here, the value through the seasonal use is going to sit way down here. That's what I'm always trying to, I know it's a, a conceptual thing, but you guys work in the abstract a lot. I always feel like I'm trying to pull you more to reality. And uh, so this is one of those points where the reality hits me. Um, just to, to make up these uses to justify a function, like storage, how many ways can you take care of that? How many ways can you take care of that? It's the programming functions that I see listed um, that worry me, the gazebo. Like, so you want to take care of another little park, maybe fine. Just don't know where we're going with this that makes real logical sense to me. I love the commercial maintaining because you got to work on the cost of land. And I love the concourse that goes through and welcomes people off the trail. It doesn't have to be you know, a new park. You can use a really cool trellis to something or other. So I'm caught. Years ago, I 
ago when Lanesboro said we're gonna we're gonna concentrate on biking and 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 those kinds of recreation uses to attract people to our community, folks thought that they were absolutely freaking insane. And ah uh, yeah. Um, more and more folks are going to be wanting to do the local staycation stuff. And that Harbor Creek Trail is an undervalued amenity because, and it, and it's an, it, it, it doesn't do enough for Forest Lake that it could do because folks don't think of going from, say, you, you go all the way to Minnetonka using the bike trail system. And, and folks don't think that they could take their family, say, from, from one of the, the state parks up through Forest Lake because there's nothing to do and there's, there's no place to stop. And where am I going to let my kids hit the restroom? And, and where am I going to, you know, let, let my butt rest for a second? Um, I think that this could be absolutely stellar for Forest Lake if we really want to invite folks to come to our community. Um, maybe it doesn't have to be as big fit, but I, I think that this does, it, it does have the potential to really, to really fulfill the, the vision that the county had on the Harbor Creek Trail and the Sunrise Trail and the Gateway Trail. Not as, as a commuter thing as much as, as, as family recreation and, and being able to cost effectively have family fun. Does, does the park stay, or the, is the kids park staying by the lake? So I don't know why we're having another kids park so close. And if we had the little signs that said park over there, it's going to draw the families across this beautiful um, to the downtown area, they're going to go to the park, they're going to see the ice cream shop, they're going to, well, that's, that's what you want to, you want to draw them in there. You get them in the park right there, they bring their own snacks, they bring their own treats, they throw them in your garbage, and they go along their way, which is great. We need a place for them to eat, but I think, I don't I think that could be directed to the other park that's so close. I agree with Susan. I think it's a whole different genre of user the bikers, the families, I see a lot of families out there and the ones hauling the little kids in the little towable. Um, they're not going to go to Lakeside Park that's so busy and the swimmers. And this, this, I think for a trailside park, this would be lovely. Um, you don't have to go to all the expense. If you have a place to go to the bathroom, lock, lock up your bike so you can walk into town on the trail. Um, maybe a few uh, ice cream stand or whatever. Um, I think it would be very well used. And the word wouldn't get around. No? Yeah. People say, oh, they all go to the Hardwood Trail. No, they've got something for the place to stop in Forest Lake. And, and we did talk a little earlier about bike access into town. And there isn't really a place to stop, lock up your bike, you know, walk across the road and, and down to Lakeside Park. And people that are biking with their families are bikers that are going out, they, they don't want to go to the park. and lake and do something. It's a different activity. They're out there to bike and to bike the trail. So but I but I think they would. I mean I I uh you know I I look at there's a similar arrangement in the, the Beaver Bay community uh, where they've got some parking access opportunities to lock up bikes just adjacent to the trail. It's a great little spot to you know stop something to drink, catch your breath, and then, you know, you can even walk to one of the local restaurants and have a bite to eat if you want to, um, and it's highly utilized. So, I don't, I don't know if I'm following you, Jenny. I, I'm, I'm supportive of something here. I don't know that it necessarily needs to be this comprehensive, but I just think it's an opportunity to stop lock up that bike and be able to walk into town, walk across the street, you know, to the shops. I don't know. There's no other place to do it along there that, right. that people can do it safely. Maybe instead of the pavilion and long games, we do a couple of, you know, you've got the outdoor cafe on the, on the northern side of us, do a couple of other cafes or 
we have a, a couple of spaces for food trucks in there, but um, like I said, you know, 30 years ago, they thought that Lanesboro were actually out of their minds. Food trucks would be perfect in there. You yeah. won't have anybody investing in a building or rent that they just that a food truck rent is, and they've got Lake Street on the other side. They could draw business from both the trail and Lake Street. <laughs> Anyway, I agree it doesn't need to be this elaborate, but I, I really like the spot. I like the idea of the spot for people to go off the trail and then have a break and then get back on the trail and go. Have you ever been to the kids' park in the, by the lake in the summer? Try and get on a swing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's crowded. It's very crowded. Yeah. So, do I hear general consensus favorable for some sort of a mixed use space adjacent to the trail. I think I think Karen maybe the, the discussion is more around allocation of use. So how big is it being gained from Spencer? But overall consensus of yes, some sort of a trail and it's yes. That is inviting. Inviting. Some level of amenities that are bike focused. Not the back parking lot of, of something that faces retail on the lake. Not that it has to be for inviting. Not the back, the back parking lot. Yeah. I mean, okay. you've, you've got Kodiak two doors down, right? What a great place to grab coffee and go sit outside, right? I, I just, I just think there's opportunity here. Very good. This reminds me of a lot of opportunities you see off the Hall Bunyan Trail, especially yes. when you go through Nisswa and yes. stuff like that. But yes. It's amazing what small bikes will go do, and I mean, I think you own you know, you know, a lot of the breweries. Yeah. And they got those breweries are small, half the size as your own, but these bikers are coming from all over the place to jump off the trail to hit that one spot for the one unique thing along that corridor. So if you come up with that unique idea like that, I think they're more interested in coming from the trail to that property we just saw, and how you can serve. Something like that, because do you think north and south there's nothing like that? Like it, you know, down in the metro. But. So the next one is the the idea of the sidewalk through the adjacent neighborhood uh, with the strategies of expanding uh, sidewalk the network uh, using the door to door and social sidewalk philosophies, and then concentrating sidewalk investments within what is the 10 minute walking loop of the downtown area. So that if you invest in sidewalks over there, there's some areas that might be farther than people actually would walk. But if you concentrate on that 10 minute loop. So as I mentioned before, this is kind of a long-term um, modification of the way people think about their neighborhood and association terms. Any specific points of feedback on this one? Why, this is the older part of Forest Lake. And is this south of Broadway and west of 61? And north of Broadway. We have not done any street improvements in the southwest quadrants. And they're much needed, but when we get to them for a while with some of the other stuff that's needed, but there's a lot of opportunity there to obviously do a lot of sidewalk connections, uh, repair enhancements. We have some stuff we can even connect through between here and over to Target as we snake through some pedestrian facilities, part of a safe house of school project, but that's that's it between here and a whole other commerce area. So yeah, a lot of good opportunities there. And a lot of cities when they do their melon overlays or when they do their 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 street partial rehab, they include a sidewalk as as part of that. We do, and I think that possibility exists for us. We do explore that on those. Uh, last example of being able to incorporate that is uh, east of St. Peter's Church, where we narrowed the road and put in the 10 foot trail on the south side of the road, and then that trail up on the north east side of the 11th Avenue down by BB gas station. And you drive through there any night on a nice night, people are using that trail all the time. Mm -hmm. Be a four foot sidewalk that it's more like a dirt track, just concrete panels were up and down. Okay, I will 
we'll look at the policy, whatever policy might be the best one. Because I have been that. Abuse and the link. So the strategies here are to consider alternative design solutions such as art and lighting for the roundabout that would allow for more see-through kinds of um, amenities there. Second one is to create landscape edges on either side of Broadway at the approach to the roundabout. Um, that would be essentially kind of public space or expanded streetscape in that area. Um, locate new, a new beach house in a place that doesn't Steer the view or kind of um, block any more of the view than necessary to like one, and then to analyze view shed impacts and future landscape concerns. That's one well, strategy, but it makes sense to have discussion. <laughs> Comments, thoughts? I love the idea of removing the boathouse or the bathhouse from its existing position. I think the perception. Park would be just so much bigger and better if we don't load it with a lot of concrete and make it into a park like setting. Uh, and I hope that that can remain as some kind of a priority. I, I realize it's a, it's a small piece of the more important, bigger puzzle, but uh, I do think that just puts wealth into that park that's beyond what it has today. Now, its relocation is, you know, it's that's a matter of debate how that can happen. And I think you probably have to talk about changing its program. Concessionary on the lake isn't something we've tried it three times down there. It's not something that really works unless it's a break through the seasons, a year round proposition, which requires a certain amount of scale. And so it's been tried. We have a, a door that could lead to a position for a, a more reduced program bathhouse and then to the patio out front. Uh, there is an opportunity, not on the corner you you know, schematically showing it, but elsewhere in that building, but you need a Probably have to. You're going to be in a multi tenant building. Just why you chose that. You need a multi tenant building that has flexibility, wants flexibility. And so you're going to put a hard case element in there, and you're going to either have to buy it or have one hell of a good landlord to talk to. Uh, so putting it there and maybe just putting it on the table and letting it go, no solution really there. Uh, that's what troubles me about getting to reality. So um, with this particular one, we have had conversations with that property owner. They uh, are basically open. I'm amazed at that. But yeah, not, even, yeah, not on that not, corner. <laughs> it would be, yeah, be on the north side. North, north side of the on the uh, northwest corner of that building. Good tolerance. Northeast. Northwest corner. I don't like it on the northeast part. That's that's putting the most valuable piece of square footage out there. If the boat house, the bathhouse goes away, that's prime real estate. It'd be hard for it. I even think anybody to keep that up. But the other side is a little less valuable. You can still come out that center door and be fed there and indicate that's a boat house. Bathhouse. So there does seem to be some I'm a little, I think about our aesthetic problems with that downtown. I, I'm a little nervous about repeating the what we spent on the current landscaping in the roundabout. We've got some signage and some memorials that should it, it, to me is one of the more downtown and so to redo that to help you share that I'm not sure that's where I would choose to spend future dollars and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself and took next steps to prioritization. The big roundabout or the little roundabout more the big roundabout. Where you've got the base sign, you know the big driveway sign behind the base sign. I, and and I would recommend keeping that one. It right? Is. Because from a safety aspect, yeah. it is one that nobody is going to go up and over the top of. Right. All right. And for, so, from a safety aspect, the big one I would leave as it is, but maybe the smaller one would would be a little different. But, you know, I would leave the big one as it is. Okay. I think that's what you're saying. Too. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Is the, the I mean, of, of our priorities and where there are real challenges, um, I'm just 
just not sure the top the top strategy gets to the top of the list. Um, if nothing else, I might just reprioritize and talk to the person about the beach house. That you should mm -hmm. later. In sense, I mean, talking with my constituents, it, it's it's a little bit less about the roundabout. It's more about the big buildings that are already there. Take them down so we can see the lake. <laughs> that's not practical. Well, that's <laughs> not even yeah, good, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I mean, people are behind the wheel driving through a roundabout. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, I, I just am trying to look at this. One. Practicality standpoint, I don't see. I don't know that a lot of change needs to happen there. And I don't. I think that view shed will be diminished over time to a certain extent. I'm still thinking that as as a important goal, we might just have to accept what we get in terms of how you use the lake yeah. and that or that portal that's really right. tightened up. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Wayfinding. This is an easy one. It directs people to the office. They do. Anyone want to challenge or change? I wouldn't say change. It's great. Just we tried this, and again, it's a mid dot situation. It's a signage we're able to put in, and that's we did it, but just it was real minimal and not. Aesthetically pleasing, they, they look like road signs basically. And so, if that again goes back to midnight, starting that conversation. Can I just make one more comment on that beach house, too? I, there again, I think we have to think about it from a practical perspective in distance from the activities, yes. right? Um, I think of skaters and trying to walk some distance. I mean, you can put skate yards on, but trying to walk a huge distance across. Stone, a stone, you know, patio or something like that. So I, I just think we, we need to be. It has yeah. to work for I think we'll summer. Right yeah, it would. Yeah. <laughs> okay. An activation. Um, one of the components of the plan is to create a natural activation chapter or activation strategy. And if you don't know what I mean by that word, it is essentially to create every day as well as kind of um, seasonal or uh, bigger events that are happening downtown that draw people um, for the sheer kind of continual change of what's going on. That's what activation is. And uh, so strategy is to work with community organizers, um, partners, to really create a robust gallery. Challenge to that. Okay. Um, next steps. So what we're going to do is what I'm going to do is uh, fill out some of the things that uh, you all talked about that are not in case and directives, modify others that we've heard about, as well as create some uh, more detailed conceptual design around a number of them that are hard to visualize or hard to understand or how they hang together. So we'll be working on that. And uh, also I'll be building out the project budgets for these directives so that they become a baseline for Back to you, and see this is in February in about a month or so, with essentially draft chapters for your first pass at. And then we'll be getting those in front of you for a period of time so you can really dig in. We want to have one more community workshop, I think, in person as well as online. Period of engagement around the draft plan with the intent that we are ready to put it in front of your political leadership, you, and then ultimately a recommendation to your political leadership um, to adopt that plan in April time. Thoughts, comments? Have your next great thought on this topic, so we send
I'm not going to do that myself. I'm going to do that. Thank you.